Good morning. Good to see everyone this morning. We are starting a new series of messages today. Um, it's actually a, a pretty abbreviated series. It's only three messages long, but uh, I really like the graphic of uh, this one. So I'm being tempted to add seven or eight more messages to the series. So uh, we might be preaching on this for three months now. But uh, yeah, Bible birds, that's, that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, there, there actually are a number of passages of Scripture that make direct references to different kinds of birds um, in the Bible. And the majority of the time, it's done to drive home a point of some type or another. And uh, um, and so these three passages we're going to be looking at uh, today and the next couple of Sundays um, serve as good examples of that. Last Sunday on the connection card, this was the question that I put out there in front of you. What is your favorite kind of bird and why? And uh, we, like Norman, got a bunch of responses um, there's probably 20-some birds represented in the different answers that were given. Uh, the number one bird that was mentioned more often than anything else, um, it is a pretty bird. Um, I got to say, though, I was a bit surprised. It was at the top of the list, um, and it was definitely at the top of the list. So it wasn't like an immediate close second place to it was cardinals. People put down cardinals as uh, being their favorite bird. So that kind of topped the list. Uh, that wasn't my number one. The number two was actually my number one. And uh, so I'm not preaching on cardinals. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, we're, we're not. This is the last you're going to hear about cardinals right now. So... Uh, what made number two on the list is actually what I expected to be at the top of the list. And like I said, it was on mine. Eagles. You know, and, and there were quite a few people that did put down eagles uh, on, on this. Uh, and then there were quite a few people that uh, just put different ones. Some of these, may, maybe Roy mentioned once, some of them three or four different times. Um, but here's what was some of what was represented. Hummingbirds, robins, finch, flamingos, uh, bluebirds, parrots, peacocks, meadowlarks, T-bird, uh, which is a pretty cool bird too, right? Um, <laughs> had, uh, had about a handful of people that wrote down chickens and turkeys. And their explanation as to why is they taste good. <laughs> and, uh, and then there was uh, uh, three or four people that put this down. This is the only one uh, besides the final one that, that is going to be represented by a picture. And even though it was only three or four people, I'm, I'm grouping this in the top three of the responses, is uh, <laughs> that bird right there. <laughs> there you go, Keith. You want to get your camera and take a picture? <laughs> now, with everything all said and done, and I'm trying to talk slow to keep as much time for that to be on the screen. When everything, <laughs> when everything was all said and done, all three services reviewed, the res uh, reviewed all the responses. There was only one person last Sunday, that gave this as their favorite bird. The sparrow. One person. I'm not sure which service that that person uh, goes to, but uh, uh, one person wrote down sparrow. And, uh, and, and I draw attention to that because that's what we're talking about today, is we're going to talk about sparrows. Uh, a little bit. At least we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that serves as a springboard, a teaching point that Jesus was making. It's found in Matthew chapter 10, verses 29 through 31. 
And I'll show you these verses here in a moment, but if you want to turn there, this is the passage that we're going to be at. Now, this is a passage that doesn't normally stick in people's minds real well, generally speaking. Um, and there's a reason for that. It, it is found in the middle of a chapter that is jam-packed with attention-grabbing statements. I mean, all over the place in Matthew chapter 10, there are some major statements being made. And so in some respects, it's kind of understandable why people that are reading through Matthew chapter 10, they don't retain this part because there's these other verses that just grab your attention. For example, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, Jesus made this statement, you will be hated by everyone because of my name. That's a prophetic statement. That's a pretty significant statement. Jesus is basically saying, you're going to associate with me. You're going to fall in line and be a follower of mine. Well, let me tell you a little bit about what you're going to encounter. Um, people aren't going to treat you the best. People are going to hate you, you know, because of your association with me. In some regards, and this is all I'm going to say on this. It's kind of a message in and of itself. But in some regards, I'm a little surprised sometimes. By the way, Christians talk, the way Christians react about uh, um, feeling slighted, you know, whether it be from the media or it just be from, from people and the way people talk in general and, and how Christians sometimes they seem to get the short end of things. And, and, and you know, I just got to say, I'm kind of surprised by that because it had been prophesied that as Christians, this world is not going to cater to us, okay? And, and so there, there's going to be, uh, you're going to experience some grief. If you associate with Jesus, you're going to, to one degree or another, you're going to experience some grief in life. That's what Jesus said. So that's one of the attention-grabbing statements. You go about 10 verses later, Jesus said this in verse 32. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. That's kind of a cool promise, right? Jesus is saying, and some of your translations say confess instead of the word acknowledge. Whoever confesses me, publicly acknowledges me in front of other people, I will acknowledge him in front of my Father in heaven. That's kind of a cool thought. But I will say this, the very next verse, I could just as easily put it up there as well. Uh, verse 33 goes on to say, whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him or her before my Father in heaven. That's kind of a sober thought. Yeah. But you can see why when someone is reading through Matthew chapter 10, I mean, those are the kind of passages that, that boy, they have staying power. They stick in your mind. It's like, well, that's, that's a significant statement. Let me show you one more. Verse 37 says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Brad Fogel shared a message several weeks back uh, where he was looking at this. I think he was primarily focused on the, the parallel gospel of Luke and its version of that statement. Uh, but that, that's a pretty major statement. Jesus basically is saying that our love for him should be an unrivaled love above and beyond everything else in our life. So, so you know, verses like those are the kind of verses that cause us to kind of blow right past what represents today's text. Not that today's text is insignificant by any means, but it just doesn't, doesn't reach up and grab you quite the same as some of these passages. Okay, so here's what it is that we're talking about today. Verses 29 through 31 says, What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin? Now, some of your translations say one penny uh, at this particular point. What's the price of two sparrows? One penny? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. 
So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a flock, a whole flock of sparrows. I find it interesting that Jesus chose the most common of all birds to teach the point that he's teaching here. And basically the point, and I'll kind of in advance of the message, right at the beginning of the message, just kind of capsule summarize the message, is that in God's eyes, no one is insignificant. I mean, that's kind of the point that he's making here. In God's eyes, no one is insignificant. In some ways, it would almost seem like from our perspective to make better sense had uh, uh, Jesus uh, used a reference to eagles. Not one eagle will fall without God's notice because when we think about an eagle, we think about something that's majestic, right? Something that's powerful. When you hear some of the stories, and we'll talk about those in a couple of weeks, about things that eagles are capable of, you know, it's just like, wow. I mean, these, these, are, these are pretty incredible birds. And, and, and so it had, had Jesus used this as his teaching point that God notices every time an eagle falls, you know, we would all be nodding. You would expect the crowd to be nodding because, uh, you know, yeah, an eagle, man, that's incredible. Those are powerful birds. But the thing is, Jesus was making a point that God cares for the most common and unnoticed birds. And so an eagle, that, that really wouldn't drive home the point near as much as what a sparrow does. And so he draws reference to sparrows. You know, in the lower 48, the continental United States, they're saying that right now we have 10,000 bald eagles. 10,000. Sounds like a huge number. And compared to where it was 40 years ago, you know, it is a pretty big number because about 40, 45 years ago, uh, what it, was, it was about 1,000 bald eagles were down uh, in the lower 48, you know, states. And that's why it was put on an endangered species list and all that. It's not on that list anymore. But, but they're saying 10,000 bald eagles in the continental United States. Now, you hold that up in comparison to sparrows. And there are tens upon tens and tens of millions of sparrows. In fact, at times, there were even more sparrows than what there are today. And you might be um, interested to know, and you can Google and read about this yourself. Uh, it's kind of funny, the types of things you can learn when you're preparing a message. Is This is a, a common house sparrow, they call it. And uh, uh, they're... They, they originally weren't even here in this part of the world. They came uh, from the other side of the world back in the mid-19th century. They brought some over here. And uh, so they've been pretty effective in multiplying, you know, tens of millions, you know, 30, 40, maybe even 50 million uh, of these guys. Sparrows are so common and uh, so unnoteworthy that we don't even notice them. Right, I mean, when when we look around, we don't we don't even see them, and chances are we see them every day, but we don't notice them. Sparrows are kind of a nuisance at times. It was just last week I had to get my ladder out and lean it up against the front of my house in a couple of spots because underneath the soffit I had a couple of little spots where sparrows had gotten in and they were building nests, and it was like I had to do something with it. I had to scare them out of there and everything, and then put some kind of wiring, you know, in there just to, to keep the sparrows out. They're, they're kind of a nuisance. They're not known for their colors. They're not really known for their songs. In verse 29 of our text, it says, you could buy two sparrows for one penny. What's interesting is, because I knew there was another passage worded different, and so this morning, when I first got here, I, I looked this up, and it was in Luke chapter 12, and uh, in Luke's gospel, he says you could buy five sparrows for two pennies. It must have been a blue light special or something that, that Luke was aware of. You know, if you, had an adult, if you had a dollar bill, can you imagine? You'd get a whole bag of spar sparrows. Just for a dime, 
you could you could buy enough sparrows if you like sparrow casserole you could make a nice a nice casserole for your family yeah sparrows they're pretty cheap because they're pretty common but you see there's there's something here that in this passage what's embedded in the passage and what's driving Jesus's words that he's trying to communicate to us is that your worth as a person has little of nothing to do with your appearance okay those little circles on your outline throw in some different words like appearance or your talent your singing ability your your worth your value as a person has little of nothing to do with how well you can sing. It has, it has nothing to do with what neighborhood you live in. It has nothing to do with uh, what it is that you choose to drive and whatever you parked out here in the parking lot. Your worth as a person has little of nothing to do with your athleticism. I mean, you stop and think about, in our culture, who gets paid the big bucks? Who's really bringing home the big paychecks? I mean, you think about entertainment, right? Entertainment. You think about guys playing ball on a basketball court or on a football field or a baseball diamond and some of these people that are making tens of millions of dollars in a year's time. You kind of think about the value system that's reflected by all of that. But the reality of the matter is that your worth as a person has little to do with your athleticism or your job. Your worth as a person has everything to do with how God views you. This is actually the bottom line of it all. Too often we base our value, we base our sense of self-worth on how someone is treating us or how someone speaks of us. And unfortunately, there may even be some that are in this room that at one particular point in time, early in your life, you were born into a family and you had a parent you know, that said some really cruel things to you. Said things like, you're ugly, or I wish you had never been born, or you're worthless, or and, you know, when you're little and you're growing up and you hear those kinds of things, especially from, like, a parent, I mean, that could really, in a real negative way, be so impactful, so hurtful. And it has a staying power to it. And, and, and so for some people, here years later, as an adult, they're still basing their sense of self-worth on words that they heard 30 years earlier from a parent that were hurtful or cruel. Some people, they, they base their sense of value of themselves, you know, on how successful they've been at a, at a particular profession or maybe a hobby that they've done and how, how well have they really done at that hobby. See, the fact of the matter is, we're all going to make mistakes. I've made mistakes, and I know you've made mistakes as well. But even though we make mistakes along the way, that does not decrease our value as people. Our value remains the same. It, mistakes don't, don't determine your value. You can go out and Work as hard as you possibly can and buy the biggest house that you can buy. And you can drive the nicest car, the nicest car parked out here on a given Sunday. You can uh, uh, work extra hours uh, without even getting paid in order to be, in order to receive employee of the month awards, month after month, or salesman awards several times throughout the year. But that doesn't make you any more valuable. That does not impact your value as a person. Value isn't based on what you do. Value isn't based on what you make. Value isn't based on who you know. All of that kind of stuff, in reality, is pretty superficial. 
when it comes to your value as a person. Your value comes from your creator. And this is the thing that comes through in Scripture. Your value should be based on the fact that you are a child of God. One of the passages that, that I like, in fact, it's the passage that says you're saved by grace, not by works, so that anyone should boast. Ephesians chapter 2. I, I like the way it says it in verse 10 of the New Living Translation. It starts that verse off by saying, we are God's masterpiece. Now, some of your translations say, we are God's workmanship, we are God's handiwork, but the New Living Translation says, we are God's masterpiece. And there's something about that, something about that that indeed does help reflect our value in God's eyes. You see, God cares about things that we don't even notice. And the case in point, as Jesus is pointing out in our text today, is sparrows. We don't notice sparrows, even though we see sparrows every day. Yet, you don't notice them. They are so commonplace, you see right through them. They are so numerous. Now, if tomorrow morning, you wake up and on your way to school or on your way to work, you see one of these, you're going to notice it, Right? I mean, it's going to grab your attention. You're going to be like, whoa, look at that. Or when you get to work and you get out of your car and you start walking in to, to the building that you work at and you see one of these perched on a branch. <laughs> That's going to grab your attention. I mean, you're going to look at all the colors. You're going to look at that beak and you're going to be like, whoa, look at that thing. Or if you see one of these which they're a little harder to see because they're so small. But they're around. There's a bunch of them around. But it's just incredible the way they can hover and all this, but yet their wings are just moving a 1,000 miles an hour, it seems. But that's the sort of thing you notice. Now, you don't notice this very often in Kansas. There was a day, though, a male pheasant. But if you see one of those, it's going to grab your attention. Now, if you're driving through South Dakota or something, you're going to see a bunch of those. You know, but you don't see many of those in Kansas anymore. But those are the kind of things that really do have a way of grabbing your attention. But uh, if on your way to work tomorrow you park and there's a tree close at hand and one of these is sitting in the branch, you're not even going to notice it's there. Because it's so common. It's so ordinary. And that's the point Jesus is making. Jesus is saying that uh, God cares about things we don't even notice. God cares about the tiniest of things, the tiniest details. And that's what in verse 30, he starts talking about hairs. God knows the number of hairs on your head. Now, from the looks of it this morning, there's a few of you that know how many hairs you got on your head, too. But, uh, but, 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 I mean, who keeps track of this sort of thing? You know, apparently someone studies this kind of stuff, and they say that the average human being loses somewhere between 80 to 100 hairs a day. And who keeps track of that? Unless you're cleaning out the shower drain or something or other. You know, I mean, there was a time when I was in my 20s that when I was going through chemo and, and all, I remember going to bed at night and when I would wake up in the morning, my pillow was covered with hair. Okay, so I noticed it. I noticed what was happening then, but that was kind of unusual circumstances. As a general rule, we, we, don't, we don't notice tiny details like this. Losing a few hairs, how many hairs do you have? But yet what Jesus is pointing out is, is that God knows. God knows exactly how many hairs you have on your head. And I think the point that he's trying to drive home with that is that if God cares about things that matter so little, then he cares about things that matter much more. If he know, notices 
every time a sparrow falls to the ground, if he knows exactly how many hairs you have on your head, if he cares about stuff like that, he cares about everything in your life. And I think that's part of what inspired Peter to say these words in 1 Peter 5, verse 7. He said, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He's just kind of building on some of Jesus' teaching and saying, he does. God does care. Remember what our Lord said? Yeah, he does care. So whatever it is you got going on in your life that's giving you grief and anxiety, talk to God about it because God cares. That's the point that he's making. Your value is not based on what some coworker says or some supervisor says about you. It is totally based on how God views you, on how God perceives you. And so let's ask and answer that question. How does God see you? Let me just take a, a couple of moments' time and refresh your memory. This isn't an exhaustive list, but I'm going to share with you six things as I reflected on it this week that helps to define what God sees when he takes a look at you and when he takes a look at me. Number one, what does he see? He sees you as being one made in his image. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. You know, that can't be said about any other part of God's creation. That can't be said about any other part. When I was a little kid growing up, one of the things that I enjoyed, I don't remember if it was on Saturday or it was on Sunday, but I enjoyed uh, watching Marlon Perkins. Anyone remember that name? Yeah. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, you know, back in the 70s. And, and part of the reason that I enjoyed watching that show is because they were always featuring animals that uh, in northeast Kansas, where I was growing up at, I didn't see these kinds of animals, all right? These animals were in some other part of the world. And on a rare occasion, maybe we'd go to a zoo and I'd see, you know, a few of these animals. But, uh, but a lot of the things being featured on that show, I never did see. I mean, they would talk about a wolf and, and what this animal does and the way it hunts in a pack and all of this kind of stuff. And it's just, it just cool. I was mesmerized by it. They would talk about hammerhead sharks. You know, and they'd show all these images, and, and I still remember as a little kid, you know, that quickly became my favorite kind of shark, a hammerhead shark, and I was always drawing pictures of hammerhead sharks. They would talk about cheetahs and how fast cheetahs are moving in on their prey. But here's the thing, in view of all of those different kinds of animals that Marlon Perkins featured on that show, None of them were made in God's image. Not a single one of them. But you were, and I was. We were made in God's image. Kind of sets us apart. That's how God sees us. Number two, as one worthy of much thought. There's a passage in the Old Testament that has always intrigued me. Um, but let me preface it by saying, who are the kind of people that you catch yourself thinking about the most? Who are the people that you find on your mind? Whether it be in the middle of the day, whether it be when you're driving in the car, whether it be in the middle of the night and you wake up, who are the people that you find yourself thinking about? They're people who are special to you. They're people that you love, right? I mean, kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, spouses. I mean, these are the people that occupy your mind more than, than anyone else. Well, here's something that David pointed out in Psalm 139 that's an incredible thought when you really let it sink in. Psalm 139, verses 17 and 18, he said this, How precious are your thoughts about me, O God, they cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. 
Now just think that through for a moment. Brett, have you ever been on a beach before? Yeah. Which beach? Do you remember? Jamaica. All right, so a beach at Jamaica. All right, just share with everyone, how many grains of sand were on that beach? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, quite a few. And the thing is, that's only one beach. There's lots of beaches. And then you got to start factoring in sandboxes. There's lots of sandboxes. You, know, you, you start thinking about, you know, these utility sheds that various cities and counties have you know, to throw on slick roads and stuff, all the sand. And you, you got to factor all that in. How many grains of sand are actually out there? I mean, it's a humongous number. And yet the teaching point that's found in Psalm 139 is God's thoughts for you outnumber the grains of sand. It tells something about what he thinks of you, not just how often he thinks of you, but what he thinks of you. He values you. Number three, how does God see you? As one chosen from the beginning. Remember what it was like on the playground when uh, uh, teams would be picked up. Somehow there'd be a couple of captains that would be selected. And uh, whether it was a basketball game or a softball game or whatever it was, um, they would then start picking um, if you were ever the first one picked, you remember how that feeling was, you know, being picked? I mean, you knew you were desired. You knew they wanted you on their team. There was something about that that was a good feeling. Okay, now the flip side of that. If you were ever the last one picked, Everybody else kind of gets divvied up, and I'll take him, I'll take her, and back and forth, back and forth. And then eventually, you're the only one standing there. Everybody else is standing over here. And so the last, the captain whose turn it is says, okay, I'll take so-and-so. Come here. Well, did they really select you, or did they get stuck with you? I mean, that's what's going through your mind, right? You know, and it's, it's a pretty humbling you know, thought. Let me, show you, let me show you a verse. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, long before he laid the earth's foundations, he had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. This is before the foundations of the earth were laid. He had his eye on you. Because he was going to love you. And he had already decided that. Some of your translations, if you have the NIV or the New American Standard or the, the Christian Standard Bible, it says something about before creation, he chose you. That means before you were ever born, you were already chosen by him. I mean, that, that should communicate something in regards to his desire. He wanted you on his team. And it says something about the value that God has in you. Number four, how does God see you? As one worth dying for. Now, you should know that this one was going to make the list. I mean, if you spend any time at all in the Bible, we know from the Bible what was behind Jesus coming and doing what he did when he went to the cross and died and all of that. We're told specifically what was driving all of that. What was driving all of that was love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Or you look in passages like 1 John 4.10 says, this is real love. Not that we loved God. Got to clarify that. Not that we loved God. We're not the ones that initiated all of this. This is real love. That he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sin. To communicate something that comes through very loud and clear. Whether you realize it or not, people have a strong need to be loved. And if you've raised kids and all of that, you know that that's true. People just, they have this inherent need 
to be loved. And if you've searched your own heart, you know that to be true. It's a very basic human need. When Jesus came, he addressed that need and loved you more than anyone has ever loved. But he addressed other needs you had as well, not to mention your sin issue. And he dealt with that when he went to the cross on your behalf. You see, that tells us something about our value in God's eyes. Number five, how does God see you? As one worth waiting for. We know that Jesus is coming back again. You can't help but know that if you read the Bible because pretty much every book of the New Testament, not every book, but pretty much every book of the New Testament makes at least one reference to the second coming of Christ. And some of them refer to it multiple times. He is coming again. The obvious question is, why hasn't he yet? What explains, you know, what seems to be an apparent delay? I mean, when you stop and you think about it, it's 20 cent- almost 20 centuries of time have passed, and yet Jesus hasn't come back yet. Well, the Bible gives us the answer as to why he hasn't come back yet. Not that he's not going to come back. He certainly is. He's planning on it. He had promised that he would. But the reason that he hasn't is explained here in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. In the context, it's clearly talking about the second coming of Christ. And it says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The reason that Jesus has not come back yet is because he knows that there are some people who have yet to make that all-important decision for one reason or another. They've been dragging their feet and they have not turned from their sin and turned toward him. And he knows that if he comes back before that all-important decision is made, then their eternal fate is sealed. And he hates to think of what that's going to mean. And so he's giving more time. And so it very well may be true that there's someone or someones in this room that for whatever reason has as of yet to make that decision to turn from the life of sin, to turn to the Lord and embrace him as their Savior. And you are part of the reason why Jesus hasn't come back yet. Now, he's not going to wait indefinitely. he's, He's going to come. But why there has seemingly been a delay thus far is because he's given you a little more time to make that all-important decision. Patiently giving you the opportunity to do what you need to do. If he didn't care, he wouldn't wait. But the fact is, he's waiting because he cares. Number six, how does God see you as one adopted into his family? On Christmas Eve in 1960, that evening I was born, and my parents were stuck with me. Okay, They couldn't return me. Two years earlier, Christmas Eve in the evening, My older brother was born, and they were stuck with him. Two years following me, it wasn't Christmas Eve, but two years following me, my sister was born. Today is her birthday. And my parents were stuck. We were all stuck with her. (laughs) And then a year later, my other sister was born in May. And then five years after that, my youngest brother. And my parent was my parents were stuck with all five of us. But what this particular point is talking about is something a little different. It's talking about this concept of adoption. Let me show you a verse. Because there's a spiritual aspect to this that I think is really cool. Ephesians 1, verse 5 says this. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. And he did this because 
He wanted to. He wanted us to be part of his family. So he pursued us in order to adopt us into his family. There's something kind of cool about that, right? Years ago, I was uh, in a, a part of a Bible study, um, and this one couple that was in the study, they lived in Fort Madison, Iowa, and, uh, um, and, and, and we were talking about one of these passages, Ephesians, this particular one, or maybe one of the other passages, because there's several passages that talk about this concept of being adopted into God's family. And anyway, that was a part of our, our Bible study that evening. And uh, Kathy, um, who's the one that lived in Fort Madison, she, she, uh, she brought up something that she had a perspective on things that was different than the rest of us. And, and she started referencing how she had been adopted by her mom and dad. And I had known Kathy uh, and her husband, Eric, for a number of years. Uh, and this was something I never knew about her. I knew her parents. You know, I, I knew not real well, but I knew her sister. Um, and, uh, but, but I never knew this about Kathy. Now, her sister uh, biologically was the do- uh, daughter of her parents, but Kathy had been adopted into the family. And so here we were sitting in the living room and we were having this discussion and everything. And I, I'm a person that immediately gets filled with lots of questions when something, you know, is presented that, that kind of catches me by surprise. And, and so I started asking Kathy these questions, like, questions like, well, how did, it, how did it feel growing up? You know, did you feel like, uh, like uh, you were a fifth wheel or something or other, you know, because uh, your sister was, you know, and I mean, you know, I was young, naive, didn't know if I was picking an old wound or anything. Those thoughts didn't even go through my mind. But I'm just like, how, how did you feel, you know, in, in regards to that or, or if kids at school found out or, or whatever? And it was in response to multiple questions along those lines. Kathy broke out with a great big grin from ear to ear. And she said, I've always felt special because I knew my parents wanted me. They would have never adopted me unless they wanted me. And so I never had struggles of any of the things that you're referencing. You know, and it explained a lot because I had seen the dynamics of our relationship with her parents and all this stuff. And it really did explain a lot. And I truly believe what she was telling me was true. But, but think about this for a moment. This, this is your story if you're a believer follower of Christ, and this is my story, we have been adopted into the family of God because God wanted us, as that verse says, he wanted us to be part of his family, and so he pursued us, and and, and so now we're part of the family of God, and that means we're heirs and co-heirs with Christ. It's just an incredible thought. But when you look down through this list, you see all of these different things, and they're all driving home the same lesson, and that is, and it's very clear, you have worth in his eyes. And if you ever struggle with that, if you ever find yourself doubting that, you know, just kind of review some of this stuff that we've talked about, and this list could have easily been twice as long, but uh, um, you have value, worth in God's eyes. Our ushers are going to be preparing for our time of communion at this point. And while they're doing that, I've got one last passage that I want to share with you. And this is a passage that comes from the same guy who uh, we uh, were looking at earlier, David, when we looked at Psalm 139, where he's talking about how numerous God's thoughts are and how they outnumber the grains of sand and all of this. Uh, But this is Psalm 8. And David has something to say here that perhaps isn't so unlike what some of you have thought before as well. And and maybe if you haven't thought it in days to come, you will think it. Here it is. Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4. David says, When I consider your heavens, 
the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of him? Human beings that you care for them. David is basically saying, I'm scratching my head on this because I can't, I just can't figure it out. In view of all that you've created, and David, you know, he was a shepherd by trade as he was growing up. And so he would have been numerous times looking out at the night sky when, you know, you didn't have light pollution from a city nearby and all this stuff. And you could have seen all of these stars and, and he was probably aware of some of the constellations. But you got to remember this is all pre-Hubble telescope days, okay? So he had no idea how how huge the universe really was and how many galaxies are out there. And there's a possibility we have no idea either, you know, of what may be discovered 10, 20, 30 years from now. It's huge. But David looking at the night sky and seeing all the stars and all this stuff and kind of seeing God's fingerprints on creation all around him, he's scratching his head and he's asking the question. He's saying, what is mankind that you're mindful of us? Who are human beings that you should care about us? You see, David was coming to that realization that God truly does care God truly does value us, him, you, me. And it's only fitting that we kind of wrap this message up leading right into our time of communion because what we're about to reflect on while these trays are being passed is one of the most incredible expressions of love that this world has ever seen. When you take the bread and you eat it in the cup and you drink it, reflect on what it is that Jesus accomplished on your half, behalf when he came into the world and he died on the cross to be able to uh, shore up for you a home in heaven, a future home, so that you could be forgiven of your sins. That was all driven by how much God cares for you. Jesus came into the world and he did what he did and went through what he went through as far as all that suffering and, and all he did that because he truly values you as a person. I mean, that's part of what we not only reflect and express gratitude and thanksgiving to God for what he, is, what he has done for us, but there's something else here we walk away with and it's just a sense of awe just like, Lord, who am I? Who am I that you would care this much for me? That you would do something so incredible. That's what David was coming to the conclusion of. And we've got the basis upon which to come to that same conclusion. Who are we? Wow, God, you are incredible. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us more than we deserve. For the sending of your son into the world to accomplish for us what we could never accomplish on our own accord. And we've been reminded today as to why you did that. It wasn't a sense of obligation. It wasn't because it was your job, a duty that you had but it's because you cared. That's why it happened, because you cared. We celebrate that. Lord, today we celebrate your love, the grace and the mercy that came from you, all because you cared and you continue to care. Lord, that blesses us in a way that there's really a lack of words to describe. But that is what we celebrate today. Thank you for caring. Thank you for sending Jesus to do what he did on our behalf. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.